Alrighty, well, uh, welcome to the Problem of Evil Solved Lesson 5. So the, uh, the conclusion of the last three lessons on free will lead us to, uh, lead us to this conclusion, that God causes evil. So that is, a, that is an inevitable result of believing that God controls human decisions, as we saw the Bible clearly teaches. If the Bible teaches that, which it does, then we have to admit that God causes evil. And uh, for some reason, uh, Calvinists have been very reluctant to accept this statement, even though plenty have admitted that God causes everything, that he, that he controls everything, so forth. There is a reluctance to admit that this means that God causes evil. As long as we don't admit that, we're going to be tying ourselves up in knots trying to reconcile things that are really irreconcilable. It's irreconcilable to believe that God doesn't cause evil and yet controls everything. It doesn't even make sense. So, we have to come to terms with this statement. If there is one thing that I would like anyone to come away with this course, from this course, it would be to uh, uh, being comfortable with this statement that God causes evil and recognizing that that is the biblical teaching. Go ahead. I've been pondering this whole thing for a couple of weeks now, and I think that the biggest problem with that statement ends up being the Westminster Confession, where it talks about God, it, it talks about God's providence and how He is in control, and yet it says, and nevertheless, God is not the author of evil. And... And so we're so inundated with the, the Westminster that God's not the author of evil that we're, we have trouble with this. Right. Very true. Um, you've actually anticipated uh, what I'm going to talk about next, which is a, lo a laundry list of, of four questions that always will come up when you make this statement. Um, so first of all, in this, in this lesson, I want to answer these four questions. Um, but then, more importantly, uh, secondly, I want to I want to present the biblical solution to the problem of evil, um, hopefully very clearly and unambiguously. But before we do that, we need to we need to deal with these four questions because they will come up, as we just saw. Um, so, question one would be: Does this make God the author of sin? If God is the cause of sin, is He the author of sin? Does this reduce men to robots or puppets. In other words, if God controls everything, does that reduce men to robots? I'll get to that in a second. You're ahead of me. You're ahead of me. Um, <laughs> the, third, the third question um, is, it, is to say that God controls everything to embrace fate or karma. Is that, is that the same? Are those the same principles or are they different? And uh, is this, uh, lastly, hyper-Calvinism? Um, is it hyper-Calvinism to say that God controls human decisions? So I'm going to assert that the answer to all these four is no. God is not the author of sin. Calvinism does not reduce men to puppets. Uh, there's a difference between fate and karma in this, in this position. And also, this is not hyper-Calvinism. Um, so first of all, let's, let's deal with this authorship question. Um, some people, uh, maybe not here, but some people might be surprised to find out that the phrase God is not the author of sin does not appear in the Bible. Uh, the Bible does not make that claim. Um, so this ends up becoming purely a linguistic issue of, of how we define the term authorship. Um, and the only reason it really is an issue at all that we need to deal with it is a number of the major confessions, like John mentioned, say that God is not the author of sin, including the Westminster and, more importantly, the London Baptist Confession, which is what one of the things that this church uh, holds to. It's in, listed in the Constitution. So I have a quotation here from the London Baptist Confession that uses this, this term. And let's see what they meant by the term authorship. The almighty power and unsearchable wisdom and goodness of God so far manifest themselves in his providence that his determinate counsel extendeth itself even to the first fall and all other sinful actions both of men and angels, and that not by bare permission, 
which he which also he most wisely and powerfully boundeth and otherwise ordereth and governeth in manifold dispensation to his most holy ends yet so as the creatures not and not for, sorry and yet as so as the sinfulness of their acts proceedeth not from the creatures or from the creatures and not from god who being the most holy and righteous neither is nor can be the author or approver of sin so uh get a little tied up in the grammar there this is all one sentence um shows how perhaps our our uh, linguistic abilities have uh, deteriorated over the centuries here but uh one thing to note here it it's if the if the confession here did not intend to contradict itself in the same paragraph obviously the authorship does not mean determinate counsel which extends itself uh, to the first fall and all the other sinful actions. They're clearly asserting here that God causes all sinful actions by his determinate counsel. And that not by bare permission. It's not a permissive permissive thing, it's an active causation. Okay? So so what did they mean by authorship? To say that God is not the author of sin. Well, it seems it seems that what they meant by the author is this. As the author of a book is the person who actually writes the book. So the author of a sin is the one who actually does the sin. So to say here the author or approver of sin, it's saying on the one hand God does not do the sin, and on the other hand he does not approve of the sin. He condemns it with his law. Yes? The word author would, would, uh, would be a fine word to describe God with. Because the illustration you gave about the author writes the book, but the characters in the book are the ones committing the actions. The author himself is not committing the actions that the characters are, but he is writing them. Yeah, um, I don't think that's exactly the idea they had when they used the term author, that the relationship between the author and... I don't think they were thinking of the relationship between the author and the characters in the book so much as the relationship between the author and the book. Um, such that the, the author is the one who writes the book, um, rather than maybe the one who commissions the book. We have the one who pays for the book, the one who actually writes the book, so forth. Um, if, they're, if they're saying that the author is the cause here, the, the ultimate first cause, then they're clearly contradicting themselves in the first paragraph. And these guys were smart enough that they didn't do things like that, I think, we can assume. So they meant, they meant something different. If if you need a footnote to this interpretation of authorship, you could reference uh, Jonathan Edwards' Freedom of the Will, where his, in his discussion of authorship, um, he talks about this word, and he, and he asserts what I've asserted here, that the author is the person who does uh, the sin or who originates the sin um, in terms of it actually coming into being. Um, that might be a little confusing, but basically the one who does the sin rather than the one who causes it. Um, and this interpretation has been carried on by a number of authors uh, since then, which I could provide you citations for. But um, I think this is sufficient to prove that authorship in the traditional uh, reform sense does not mean um, causation. Is that clear? Otherwise, this confession would be contradicting itself. The, the other thing to notice, just before we move on from this quotation, I would just like to point out very clearly that what in my in my first lectures here on free will I have not departed from historic Calvinism. This uh, this quotation is was written in 1689 over 300 years ago, and notice they say that the determinate counsel of God controls sinful actions not by bare permission, so that God actively call causes sin. Um, this is nothing more or less than the traditional Reformed understanding. Of, uh, of the Bible's teaching. I'd like to emphasize that. Does anyone have anything to say on this quotation before we continue? So then, if God is not the author of sin, what about this next question? Does this reduce men to robots or puppets? So this is possibly the most common accusation. Well, you've just you know, turned me into a robot. I don't. If I don't make free decisions, now I don't make a decision at all. I'm just... I'm just a robot or a puppet or an automaton or something like that. So 
Um, oh, I have, a, I have a chart here that shows the differences between men and robots. This, the differences and similarities between men and robots. So they have only one thing in common, and this they do have in common, that the actions of a man and a robot are entirely controlled by their maker. Entirely and completely controlled. That they have in common. If that's all you mean by a robot, then men are robots. However, that is not what a robot is. A robot, furthermore, is mechanically controlled. Men, on the other hand, are divinely controlled. So our bodies um, are not ultimately controlled by the laws of physics. They are ultimately controlled by our soul. Um, such that in the next point there you see robots don't have a mind and a soul, so they don't properly make decisions at all. Um, men, on the other hand, do have a mind and a will. So they actually do make decisions, although those decisions are controlled. Um, if you remember a few lessons ago, we talked about uh, three different forms of determinism, or three different kinds of things that could control the will. One is mechanical determinism, which says that the laws of physics control everything in the universe. Um, this would be the kind of determinism that, a mechanical determinism that controls robots, which uh, causes them not to make decisions at all, essentially. On the other hand, men have a mind and a will. They're the two other forms of determinism are psychological determinism, which says that you always choose your strongest motivation, basically that your mind controls your will, and then finally divine determinism, which says that God controls the will. The other two apply to men. However, again, Calvinism has always denied that men are mechanically controlled. If men are not mechanically controlled, they're not robots. Um, does this make any kind of sense, or is this just confusing? There are some, the important point here is that while control is complete in both cases, there are some important distinctions between the nature of robots or puppets and the nature of men, um, such that men actually do make decisions even though they're not free, while as robots are just following lines of code. Like, that's not a decision going on there. It's just, it's just a computer program running. Okay, so men are not robots. <clears throat> Calvinism versus fate and karma. So, is asserting you know a complete divine control is that the same thing as as fate? Do we just end up with a fatalism uh, that says nothing I do contributes to the future? Basically, well, here here's uh, here's the difference. Uh, first of all, here's this is the key idea of fate and karma. Future events are not dependent on what happens in the present. That is. That seems, in, in my reading, to be a key component of fate. Such that, if it's, if it's determinate that I'm going to hell, if, if that's my fate, then nothing I do in the present is going to change that, or, it's not, or is even related to that causally. There's no causal relationship between my future and what I do in the present. How does that relate to, uh, to Calvinism? Here is, again, a, a, a comparison. So, first of all, they do correspond in one sense, and that is that future events are predetermined. Both the idea of fate and the idea of, of Calvinism both agree that future events are wholly and completely determinate, predetermined. But that's where the agreement ends, again. In Calvinism, future events are caused by present events, such that if you are going to hell, that is caused by the fact that you don't believe in the present. Or if you're going to heaven, it, that is caused by uh, you believing the gospel. On the other hand, fate and karma say that future events are not caused uh, by, by events in the present, such that if you're fated to go to hell, you're going to go to hell regardless of whether you believe the gospel or not. That if that's your fate, that's your fate. It doesn't matter. Um, karma, karma is a bit of a species of fate. Um, in, in my limited understanding of karma, basically, um, you're, so you have this idea of, of life cycles looping, right? So you're reincarnated in your next life, and your present life is always determined by how you act and acted in your past life. So if, uh, if I was good in my previous life, I'm going to have a good life here regardless of what I do. But if I do bad things in this life, that's not going to affect this life, but it will mean I'll be reincarnated as something bad and I'll have a bad life in my next life. So 
you still have this idea that your current actions are not you know, affecting your, at least your midterm future, um, even though they're affecting your long-term future. So it's a, it's a different idea, but the same concept is there. Um, but anyway, this, this I think is sufficient to prove that Calvinism does not uh, hold to fate or karma. They're, they're different concepts. And the key difference is that your present is determining your future, even though your present is also determined. Um, everything's determined, but within that whole determinate plan, you know, A causes B and B causes C all the way down, such that if you want to end up in heaven, you have to believe the gospel now. Does that make sense? Last question, then. Is this hyper-Calvinism? If any, uh, any, pretty much, this is a nebulous term, that, kind of an invective that's just thrown around. Anyone who takes a strong position on, uh, on any Calvinistic doctrine, like limited atonement or predestination, is probably going to be labeled a hyper-Calvinist at some point. Um, but it, it, it's, like I said, it's kind of a nebulous, uh, there's not any super clear definition of hyper-Calvinism that I was able to find or that's universally agreed upon, but this is, uh, this is kind of a start. Hyper-Calvinism is, generally speaking, the belief that the gospel should not be preached to all men or that all sinners do not have the duty to believe the gospel. That's, that, those two elements seem to be part of, of hyper-Calvinism generally. Um, this is different from the view that I've been presenting. The view that I've been presenting is that God controls all human decisions. However, God still gives instructions, gives commands, and one of those is to preach the gospel. Therefore, we preach the gospel to everybody because that's the command of God, even though fully, full well knowing that only the elect will repent. Only those that are predetermined to repent will repent. But that doesn't mean that we can't preach the gospel to everybody. Hyper-Calvinism makes the mistake, the logical blunder, of thinking that since not all men are going to believe, we shouldn't preach to everyone. Um, that doesn't follow at all. It, it's, it's just not true. It doesn't make sense. Um, on the same... On the, on the other side, sinners, they also believe, at least some of them would believe, that, that sinners do not have the duty to believe the gospel. So that the command that God gives to people to, to believe, uh, to repent and believe, is limited to the elect, so, such that the, the wicked will not be punished for not believing the gospel. Um, again, I think the Bible is clear that the, the, the command to believe the gospel goes out to all men to repent and believe. And it's not, and that's not inconsistent with, with the idea that God predetermines all decisions. So then, the answer to all these four questions is no. This God is not the author of sin because He's not the one who actually does the sin. God, uh, this does not re reduce men to robots or puppets because uh, robots are entirely physical and men are have a spiritual component where the decisions are being made. Um, this is not the same thing as fate because the present does affect the future even though all is determined and lastly this is not hyper Calvinism because it has nothing to do with evangelism um, or with nothing to do with who you should evangelize the fact that God predetermines all events has nothing whatever to do with who you should evangelize um, does anyone have any comments on that before we move on So then, in light, of, in light of these things, what is the correct solution to, or the biblical solution to the problem of evil? We have looked uh, in great detail at the Arminian or the free will solution to the problem of evil. The, the belief that, that uh, God's, while all-powerful, does not control everything. We've seen that that does not work. It's not biblical. Um, what is the correct solution? Here's the problem again. You're probably sick of this slide by now, but this is, we, this is the problem. The, the issue is that if all of these four premises are true, there, there's a contradiction. We cannot believe all four of these at the same time, and yet the, the claim is that Christianity holds to all four of these, and therefore Christianity is false. Um, so the idea is that one, God is morally good, two, God is omnipotent, Three, a morally good God cannot cause evil. And four, evil exists. So if we accept 
premises one, three, and four, if God is good and a good God cannot cause evil and evil exists, then we cannot believe in premise two because there must be something outside of God's control, otherwise he would be causing the evil and not be good. On the other hand, if we believe in two, three, and four, that God is omnipotent, that um, a morally good God can't cause evil and that evil exists, then God must be evil because he's causing sin, right? So we seem to have to deny uh, either premise one or premise two, or that's the argument. However, any one of these premises can be denied and solve the problem. Um, we saw that you know, the free will argument is essentially to change or to deny premise two, that God controls all human decisions. I'm going to suggest that we actually deny premise three, that a morally good God cannot cause evil. Supposing that we deny that. Supposing that a good God can cause evil. The problem of evil goes away. So is it true? Is that true, that a good God can cause evil and still not be responsible for it? We have to have a way of absolving God of responsibility for evil, otherwise we're right back where we started. And here is a flawed, the flawed assumption. This assumption uh, seems to pervade all the discussions of the problem of evil, and it's seldom questioned. But I believe this assumption is false. The cause of a sin is always responsible. If that is true, and God causes sin, then God is responsible. But if God causes sin, and he's not responsible, this assumption must be false. It has to be, or else we will arrive at a God that is responsible for evil. So, where did this assumption come from? This is interesting. This actually is a tenet of biblical law, that the cause is responsible. Um, in God's law for humans, this is true, and, and here's why. Here's an example. So this is a case law. If the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past, and it hath been testified to his owner, and he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner shall also be put to death. Now the owner is not the one who actually did the crime, but he knew that it was possible. He didn't take steps to prevent it, therefore he came, he became an accessory to the crime or a cause to the crime. And therefore he's responsible and he is also guilty, even though he never actually did anything wrong, in the sense of did anything actively. He didn't actually kill the man or the woman. So if I cause a crime or I cause a sin, I am responsible as a human. The mistake comes in when we assume that this relationship um, or this law for humans applies to God as well. If it does not apply to God, then we have no issue. So what I would like to prove is this statement, that God is above the law. And there's two, uh, there's two reasons for believing this. Um, we, I believe we must believe this. Um, first is, God has no one to be responsible to. If you look at that word responsible or responsibility, you'll see the word response in it. So to be responsible to someone means you have to be giving a response to that person. So it assumes another person. It assumes a higher person. A soldier has to give an account for his actions to his commanding officer because he has a commanding officer. If, if you're the top general, you don't have to give an account to anybody. You just give orders. Okay? If God is guilty, that implies that there's a superior. But we already know, according to the Bible, that God has no superior. God is the superior. Therefore, the very concept of guilt does not apply to God. The whole concept does not apply. It's, it, it, it ceases to have any meaning when you're talking about a supreme being. Furthermore, secondly, God has no laws to follow. If God is the supreme being, there is nothing above him, not even law. Therefore, God must be above the law. To sin or to be guilty means that you have broken a law. But if God is truly above the law, then he has no laws to follow. He cannot break the law. Not, it's not that he does not break the law, it's that he cannot break the law. The whole, the whole concept of sin, morality, of responsibility, guilt, ethics, all of that does not make any sense when you're talking about a supreme being. It all implies a, the relationship of a superior to a subordinate. Therefore, God is above the law and God is not responsible uh, for, what hap for anything that happens. Um, in terms of being guilty, in terms of having to give an account. This then is a complete solution to the problem of evil. 
If God has no superior, he cannot be responsible, he cannot be guilty, therefore he is not responsible for evil. So, we deny premise three, a morally, and say that a morally good God can cause evil. This is entirely uh, logically possible, and, uh, and it seems, in fact, that it must be possible um, by the very nature of law and morality itself. Therefore, God is not responsible for evil, and he is good and omnipotent at the same time. I would submit that that is a complete and biblical solution to the problem of evil. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? So only, uh, only one thing remains, if we accept this, only one thing remains to be answered. We've seen that God is not responsible. We've seen how that's the case. The question is, under this predetermined system, what is the basis for human responsibility? It's clear that God is not responsible regardless of what happens. Um, God is not, cannot be called to account. But on what basis can we be called to account if our actions are entirely predetermined? And that is the uh, subject that we will turn to in the next lesson. Um, Basically, free will, which we've spent such a long time trying to dispose of, is the common way that responsibility or guilt is thought about, such that um, I am responsible for an action if I do it freely. So if, you, if someone came up and grabbed my arm and forced me to kill somebody, I would not be responsible because I did not do that of my own free will, right? Therefore, free will is the, is the basis of responsibility. God can only hold men responsible if they act freely. However, if, if free will does not exist, as we have seen, then there must be a different way that responsibility is attached to a particular person. And so what we want to inquire is, what is that way? And it has to explain, one, how men are responsible when they do sinful acts, and two, how is it that some men do sinful acts and yet are not responsible for them? How is it that the elect have their sins or their responsibility transferred to Christ and are therefore not responsible for their actions? Um, we have to have a, 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 a basis for responsibility that accounts for both of those things. And that is what we will attempt in the, uh, in the next few lessons following this. That is the end of my slideshow. So um, does anyone have anything to say? Yes. Um, the, uh, I, believe he's, I believe he's a Roman Catholic theologian, Alvin Plantinga. Um, that, that's, that's his basis for saying that, that, that God, is, as I understand it, that God is good, that goodness exists outside of God. I think, I think he's got a lot of theological problems here. That, that in, in the universe somehow things like good and evil exist. Right. And that God is just the ultimate um, um, manifestation, maybe. manifestation yeah. of, of such. But um, I, think, I think he's got all kinds of theological problems as a result of that. Yeah. Because to your point, that something must exist outside of God. And I don't think you I don't think you can do it. Right. If there is an ultimate reality outside of God, then God is not omnipotent. He's not controlling that thing. And therefore he's not omnipotent. And you land yourself right back where we in the problems we started this you know, discussion. Yeah. Uh, just to add on to what Joel said, if good and evil does exist outside of God, then in fact law exists outside of God. And that would make God subject to that law. And yes. since uh, the definition of, of his perfection would be different in that he has perfectly kept that law, which is outside of himself thus far. Right. Right? Instead of him being the, the uh, producer of that law. Right. Law. right. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. We cannot, we cannot put God under the law or else he becomes, he becomes a being like us. Um, think about it too. It's like, like we, we tend to think of good and evil in terms of each other. Um, killing each other and stealing from each other. That type of thing. 
And um, but if the, it, 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 it has to be from God because if we, if we think of ter in terms of us, good and evil, well then then there was if there was no us, but there's still God, then how could you possibly even come up with the definition of good and evil? Right. You would not be able to do it. Right. The the concept of law implies at least two people, right? right. So if there's only God, then how can he sin against somebody, right? Is that what you were getting at? Yeah. It has to be that God cannot be um, subject to law. Right. As, as we are, it, it can't be. I was saying that the idea, in terms of God's plan, the idea of law came after his idea of, uh, of people. So first he, had, he said, okay, I'm going to make people, and then I'm going to make a law for them to follow. Um, you, you can't have the idea of law without having people. So, I, what you said that there must be at least two people for law to exist. Would not has not God's law existed prior to the existence of everything? As I mean, I would I would suggest is that it, is it not infinite and, and I would suggest that law was a creation of God, um, just as much as. As we are a creation of God, but was um, was was God? I'm trying to think. If if He is completely righteous, God, and He is has existed long before anything else has existed, being that there is righteousness, perhaps I, 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 I perhaps that perhaps God's uh, righteousness or His uh, His goodness is. Me, or have a different meaning when applied to God than when applied to humans. So when we say that we are good, we mean that whoever we're saying is good follows the law, that he's a good moral person in terms of the law. If the law does not apply to God, then his, his goodness is not a function of law. Um, his goodness must be a, a function of something else. Like we could say that he is good because he, he is maybe infinitely wise, um, and that is a, a good perfection about him. Um, but we cannot say that he is he is good in the sense that he has kept any law. Um, Separate definition. Yeah. And per, and perhaps that has been an error, um, where where men have assumed that that because we are morally good and because of some assumption that God must be the ultimate perfection of everything that we are, therefore God must be must have a, a morality about him as well. Um, but maybe, maybe the idea of morality itself does not apply to God. Maybe, maybe his goodness is outside of, of that. Yeah. Good. One guy on my side. <laughs> Anybody else? You speak a little bit. We're talking about we're not puppets. Can you speak a little bit and maybe give some compare and comparisons and, and some contrast between that and the illustration that we are just pots and vessels, which also do not have a mind or a will. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. And it, it's, so we are compared to mindless things. We are. We are. Right. Right. Well, they do. Like I said. Men and puppets correspond in one respect, that, that their actions are entirely controlled by their maker. So they correspond with pots in that way as well. Um, I think the point of the pots is that we don't have any rights. Um, when, when the Bible says we're, the relationship between us and God is the potter, the potter to the clay, he's saying we don't have any rights, so we can't give. You know, we're not above God, so we can't call him to account. Um, He's addressing somebody who's questioning God right. about a decision he's made. Exactly. So he Which is to logically put yourself as God's superior, calling him to account. Um, I don't know if the Bible ever makes an analogy of the puppet's idea of, of us being entirely controlled. I don't know. But it, it, it might be a helpful, it's a helpful analogy in illustrating that the control isn't, is complete. It's not helpful in that puppets don't have a mind. Uh, and so, and so the their 
physically controlled, not not psychologically and, and divinely controlled like we are. And that's where people get tied up and they say, well, just because it's completely controlled, you know, then we must not be any more responsible than puppet, puppets. But that's not true because there's some key differences between us and puppets. Is that what you were getting at or yeah, do you have some other ideas? No, on no, that? no, that was, that was pretty much it. Of course, pots don't do anything at all. So. <laughs> There's a sense in which it's a distinction without a difference in that uh, puppets and robots would be responsible if God said they were responsible. That is true too. Yeah. Right? So it's God is the measure of all things outside of himself. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to creation, it, we just have to deal with what we're given. What you've given us is the, the pure logic behind what the Bible says. Um, you, can, you can say that about the, the, the puppets. You can say that about the fate versus karma. And again, distinctions without difference, except that this is what the Bible says. And we have to, that's what we must measure ourselves against. Right? Is what it comes down to. Right. And we can measure God against nothing. Right. If he had decided to use a reincarnation lifestyle or life cycle, like we would have to take that. To right. Take that. Or if he had just said that that robots are responsible um, agents, which I don't think he has said, but if he had said that. If know, he had said that. Right. right. Speaking of what you just said, um, we, uh, animals, we wouldn't think of animals as subject to God's law in the same way that we are, right? I mean, they don't have to. They steal, they do, and they, they correct. But there are certain instances, like the instance you yeah, said where the, the ox bore somebody, and instead of just taking that ox and putting him in a fence, he's, he's put to death. The ox is killed. Um, when, was it, was it Mount Sinai, when the people were forbidden for going toward the mountain and they said even if an even if an ox went and touched the mountain that ox was to be put to death. Um, also with, with bestiality. Even yeah, though that animal is not really in control of the situation, the animal's put to death. So in, in some instances I guess the Lord does hold them responsible yeah. or, or I'm not sure uh, if it if we should consider that I don't, I don't I'm not know. sure if we could should consider that a moral responsibility or they, they receive, they incur guilt, though. Or I don't know if it's guilt, technically, if it's technically guilt in the same way that we're guilty, or if it's just that God's law has mandated punishment, or in the absence of guilt, or in in the uh, in a case where guilt doesn't apply. It it seems like guilt in the Bible was always attached to to thinking objects, but. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe this is a case of the contrary. Well, it's certainly saying, we're talking about robots would be held responsible if God deemed them right. to be held responsible. So that's the comparison. Yeah, I'm yeah. About. And I think that too, in uh, in the sense of destroying an ox or an animal, uh, it's a it's a punishment for the owner of that animal because it's a financial loss. True, unless he's getting put to death as well. It, it, it's still yeah, it's still punishment. Yeah. Part of the punishment. Yeah. What if he's not the owner of the animal that was involved in the PCI? Well, the owner has a responsibility for his animal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, you're saying what? Yeah. You're saying if, if the owner was not involved with the act of bestiality, but oh. someone else in the middle of the night came, whatever, yeah. then he's taking a loss even though he was not involved in the act. Yeah. You wonder in that case if. <clears throat> If the other person would have to make restitution to the owner, yeah. um, because if the owner didn't have any knowledge in the matter, um, yeah, I'd have to look and, and recheck it there. Well, I don't, I don't think that's in the in yeah. the text, but well, if he, if somebody came and took the animal, he was a thief. Yeah. Yes, he owes restitution. That's yeah. that's in there. Yeah. If if you assume that that God is above the law and created the law, then God could have created the law any way He wanted to. Um, and therefore, um, these uh, these things that we're arguing about, it's more about what 
what he did do than what he could have done. Um, these are not. Except that I'll argue that, that God is perfect. He couldn't create the loss any way he wanted to. Why not? Because uh, there would be, there, there's an internal consistency to God's, oh. to God's perfection. Okay. He can't create a law that would be Well, imperfect. you're saying, you're saying uh, his, his decrees have to be logically consistent. Correct. Um, are you saying that there's a more than that, or just basically God couldn't have decreed that we must murder and not murder at the same time? Yeah. But there surely would have been other logically consistent systems of law besides the one he created. Well, if God is perfect, there's only one way to create. Perfect in what sense, though? Is it, aren't you assuming that there's some if there's some standard of perfection above God that is uh, that is governing then the way He can create law? Um, I, I see what you're saying. I, I don't mean to apply that. I'm, but I, when when we consider the idea of truth and perfection, there is only there's a single point of perfection. There's a single point of truth. It's a, there's singularity to it. Right. And and so if it's singular, it means it can't be anything but itself. But but we have to know what the what is the reason why it can't be other otherwise than it is. Certainly because because there's only one God and only one plan, nothing could be otherwise than it is. But that the reason for that is just because that's how God decided to do it, not because there was something in God or above God that was forcing him to do it in a particular way. Only his nature. Yeah, could, could you say he didn't do it any other way because it would have been inconsistent with himself? Well, I don't see how you really can say that. What, how can you say that a different, how can you say that a different form of law would have been inconsistent with himself when there was no, there is no law except the one that he created for it to be inconsistent with. Um, how can you say that um, it would be inconsistent for God to say that, uh, let's say that the Ten Commandments were all reversed, to say that murder is good, stealing is good, you know, whatever. If that's the law he wanted to create for his creatures, um, how is that inconsistent with his nature as being, you know, omnipotent, omniscient, all these things? Um, the only evidence would be because this is the law that he that he instilled. Right. So we're not debating whether or not what he's done is absolute and unchangeable. We're debating whether or not what what is the reason that it's absolute and unchangeable. Um, what I'm saying is that the reason is is because that's what God decided to do, and He is unchangeable Himself, and therefore He doesn't change His mind. Um, that's the absoluteness about it. Um, not that there's something in God or above God. The only thing that, the only perhaps constraint that you could say that he had is that, is the laws of logic themselves. Um, if those are, in fact, the way that God thinks, then, you know, there could be no plan that would, where murder and, and not murder are, are the, you know, both commanded. That wouldn't, that doesn't even make sense. But any plan that makes sense, we, we can't say that there was something reason why God couldn't do that. But wouldn't you be arguing for logic existing outside of God and being bound by logic? And that not if uh, not if logic is uh, is just if you define logic as the way that God thinks, um, then no. Then it's a, then it's a, de a a description of him, not a uh, not something outside or above or, or in separate from him or whatever. Well, I think that's, that's, that's basically the definition. I think that John was getting at that it, you're, you're drawing it back to his nature and this is what he did, therefore well, it yeah. couldn't have been done any I get that. That is the common way because it would have been against his nature. That is the common way of thinking about it. But I think there's an error there. And if you just stick with me on this, the nature of God is is his description. It's who he is. Um, 
if I would talk about the nature of a balloon, it would be you know elastic, inflatable, things like that. They're all descriptions of God, or descriptions of the balloon. That's what that's what a nature is. It's a definition. Um, if we think about it that way, the only things that can be part of the nature of God are things that describe God, such as omniscience or omnipotence, not murder is sin. That does not describe God, that describes murder. Um, or, for instance, you know, logic is a way that God thinks. That describes God, not logic. The word that describes him is he is the life. So wouldn't, by nature, murder be... You mean when it says, like, he is the way, the truth, and the life? Yeah. Well, is God literally a way? I think there's a metaphorical bit going on in that verse. Um, God is the way in the sense that he's ordained the only way to life. Um, well, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're getting at. Well, I mean, if someone murders somebody, you would say it's wrong, number one, because the Lord said it, but also because it's against... As an image bearer of God, we are uh, defacing God. We are making God out to be a liar, basically. Like, we're doing something that's not of His nature. Well, we're doing something that is an affront to Him, certainly, because He's made a law against it. Um, and doubtless, the image of God is the reason why He's made a law against it. But that doesn't have anything to do with whether that law is part of His nature. How do you separate the two? Um, well, they seem to be, to be totally different concepts. The nature of something is its definition, meaning everything that's part of the nature has to be a description of that thing. And the law is not a description of God, therefore the law is not part of God's nature. You're inventing, what the, I think the problem is here, we've invented a nature of God that is a component part of his being, separate from his will and his or his mind, and things like that. So we've created a God with parts. And we have one part of God, uh, his nature, governing another part, his will. And yet, that's not, a, that's not accurate. God is a singularity. Um, he, is, he is, there is no parts uh, to God. And, and, and so the nature of God is not a part of his being, it is rather a description of him. Um, and if you if you understand that, then you then it becomes obvious that the law cannot be part of God; it must be a part of His plan, uh, because it is not a you know it's not a description of God. Does that make any kind of sense, or am I just muddying? I think about it. it's, it's the idea that God is simple. Yes, as is that God is love, God is life, God is, but He's all those things that He is all at once, without part or division, or it, it's all, like you said, singular. It's, it's simple. And I wouldn't disagree with that. And I'm trying to see if, if my position is actually I, in disagreement well, with that. When you say God is love, God is those things, I don't think those are technically, those are metaphorical statements. They're not, they're not proper statements. The only the proper statements are things like God is omniscient, God is omnipotent. Those are correct aspects of God's nature. Um, God is love um, only makes is, is, a, is a more yeah. a description of his plan. I was, yeah. than, I was just yeah. pulling things out. Just but yes, the simplicity of God is the, is the fact that God has no parts or passions as the confession says. Which means basically he's not like us that has body and spirit and different parts. Yeah. Yeah. We make a mistake when Sorry. Right. A mistake when we talk about attributes of God, because attributes implies parts and differences. If you think there's, a, there's a, I shouldn't even use this term because it's not well understood. But if you think there's a metaphysical difference in between God's attributes, then that is false. They're just different words or descriptions or ideas about God, but God himself is a singular unit. I mean, you know, times about up, but you know, as we understand love and righteousness as humans, and then you try to reconcile with that that God causes this, and if God's causing this for His glory and sending people to hell for to show His plan, I mean, you almost can't hardly use good in the sense that a human understands it. Because if I try to tell somebody that a good God is doing this, then they're going to go, that's not a good God. 
and that's just what they're going to say. So it's like, how do you say, you know, God is good, but it doesn't seem like it's good to everybody. <laughs> what, what we can say, which doesn't involve any confusion, is that God is not responsible for, for evil. That he is not morally culpable for evil. And that that is true regardless of whether or not God has created morality or that or God is moral himself or whatever you believe about be that. True, but it just doesn't make sense to my mind. If he caused it which is what Paul says, well you know, then then the creature will ask, why do you still find Paul? I mean it's just a logical question that you have to ask and basically Paul says you don't have a great time. Doesn't, you know, it right, says you don't have a right to, to, to call, ask it to call God into question. Right. I do think we can understand that. Do you think so? Because, because if God has no superior, He cannot be guilty. Right. As right. Paul says. Um, uh, oh, that's a good. Well, anyway, in, in that in that passage, it says, um, uh, "What does it say?" Paul says, "Who are you, O oh man, to question God?" And I, I've heard. Different people say when he says, "Who are you, old man?" The question God basically Paul is just kind of like, "Well, you can't ask that question," and yeah. and just kind of like uh, talking it away, kind of trying to skirt around the issue. But I, I don't think he is. I think when he says, "Oh man," he's speaking uh, to what you had said earlier. The man has no rights. Man has nothing. It's followed up by the phrase, "Hath not the potter power over the clay?" Okay. See, that's the explanation. That's the solution. Potter has power over the clay. God has power over us to decide when we're going to and when we're not. Um, and it's not that we're not allowed to understand or ask, it's that we're not allowed to accuse. And the answer is then that the potter has right. power. Right. And the potter and the clay, I almost look, doesn't even just go to man, but it actually goes to all creation in general, everything. Yeah. Since he said in the beginning, well, God created, that's. The potter. Yeah. With exactly. the clay. Exactly. Let's, uh, I guess we'll uh, close with the words of Dalton then. Uh, um, thanks a lot, Dalton. Um, thanks, uh, and thank you everybody for listening.